Mr. Bleeker here. I'm going to start with chapter 19, section 2, viruses. I always start with viruses because they're considered to be a non-cellular version of life. Now let me say that again. I want to be real clear about this. Non-cellular. They don't have a membrane. They don't have cytoplasm. Really what they are is like a protein prison their body is crystalline and inside is their genetic core. I'll talk about this more as the lesson progresses, but viruses sometimes aren't even considered to be living because they don't respire. They don't make their own energy from nutrients that they take in. In fact, they don't eat and they don't res they don't breathe and they don't do any of the things that cellular based life forms would do. So viruses, pretty interesting organism. What you're looking at here, and we'll get into it in, in a lot of detail, is sort of a classic sort of stock model of what we call the T4 bacteriophage. And this diagram, of course, is completely testable. So hint, hint, testable. When we refer to the virus's body, we say that it's largely a crystalline structure. Viruses make us sick because they use their bodies to deliver their genetic core. And once their genetic core is more or less inserted into us, almost like a hypodermic needle, um, it affects our cells. And our cells can be very severely influenced by viruses to the point where, for example, say you have a cold sore, a herpes simplex virus, your cells are literally bursting as they've been hijacked and taken over. Literally, your cells have been taken over. And what they're doing is they're drones now zombie cells that are making baby viruses. Now this virus here, its genetic core is in this region. There's a little window drawn here and I'm just going to highlight that. And the head, sometimes referred to as the capsid, contains the genetic information. In this case, deoxyribonucleic acid, which is double-stranded genetic material. As we progress, I'll talk a little bit more about ribonucleic acid which is single-stranded genetic material. You've got your little tail fibers here, also crystalline. This is all made of protein. The sheath, these layers here, the tail sheath. And what isn't labeled, and I always tell my students I, I really do want this, is this end point here, this sort of spike plate, is the base plate. It's the injection site. So I wanted to add that to the mix. And our poor friend over here, he's, well, it's kind of interesting. He's not sick from the T4 bacteriophage. The T4 bacteriophage actually attacks um, exactly what it says. It attacks bacteria. And this guy is not bacteria. A phage, let's just point out, phage is a word that means virus. So let's go back to red. I'll highlight this section of the word. This fellow over here, his nose is all red like a cherry. Poor guy. Let's fill him in. He would have most likely in influenza or a rhinovirus, the common cold. And his capillaries are dilating during his sickness there. So viruses. Here's here's something that I suffer from. A lot of folks do. Um, and yes, it is the herpes simplex virus. What you have here are cells, and I'll go over this well, that have been infected with the herpes simplex virus. And in a similar way to the uh, version that, uh, well, let's just say works south of the border in your reproductive tract, um, genital herpes, you get these outbreaks at various times, and we'll outline when, usually during times of stress or um, when you're immune compromised, worn down, etc., and the little viruses, they, they'll just come busting out and they're, they're lysing your cells and they're looking to infect more lip cells. And it's, it's a nasty little effect. There's some neat medication for this right now that, that helps me out in particular. And a word to the wise, if you were suffering from something like this, I, oral sex would not be uh, a good idea.
Okay, you, you, I don't think you really want to tempt the uh, the vi the fates with this virus, which is a herpes simplex virus, while having oral sex. Just no, don't go there. So viruses themselves, they can only reproduce by taking over existing uh, cells. So they are what we call hopeless or obligate parasites. They need us. So we sometimes refer to them as obligate intracellular parasites. It means they must go in our cells and parasitize us. A parasite is something that only hurts its host. Really, it doesn't give anything back. The virus body, interestingly enough, for those of you who weren't wondering about the anatomy of the virus body, Mostly what you find is it's got its protein coat and it's got its nucleic acid core. Let's make a little side note. With the nucleic acid core, nucleic acid, let's just write Na over top of that. So you think about, well, I know a nucleic acid, DNA. Well, you'd be bang on. That's one version. Actually, there's several. But for the code of life, that code that says how an organism is, is constructed and how that code should essentially create that organism, we've got two forms, DNA and RNA. Now come back for Biology 12 and we'll talk all, all about uh, protein expression, how, how DNA has so much to do with that. But for now, let's just point out that DNA is a double-stranded code and RNA is a single-stranded code. Now the body, as I've said, could be protein, but it can also, as in the case with uh, some influenza viruses, HIV, um, contain lipids, which is like a fatty layer, kind of like our, our cell membrane is, is composed of a type of a lipid. And there's three types of lipids, just so you know, fats, oils, and waxes. But being covered in a lipid is, is a smart thing for viruses to do. It helps them get into our cells a little easier. All right, so some stock examples. The T4 bacteriophage. How did we know about its structure? Well, instead of bouncing light waves off this thing, we bounce electrons. We had to. These things are a thousand times smaller, a thousand times smaller than even our red blood cells. They are on a scale. It's unimaginable, really. The scale that they live on is extremely tiny. We're talking 10 to the minus 9. That's a nanometer. Okay, so here's a challenge for you. Go grab a meter stick, find the sharpest blade you can, and what I want you to do is cut it into 1 billion small pieces. And once you do, take a few of those 1 billionth sized pieces and line them up, and that would be about the size of your average virus. They are ridiculously small. Let's put it this way. Smaller, smaller on an order of, of 100 times or more than even bacteria. So a couple of interesting ones here. We've got the T4 bacteriophage, which is a silent assassin, and it kills E. coli. And you might have heard of that one, E. coli, hamburger meat, meat products, okay, especially, especially beef, right? You hear about this E. coli problem. Well, this T4 bacteriophage is excellent at munching on E. coli. Here's one that isn't very good for the tobacco industry, okay? The tobacco mosaic virus. And this virus itself, what it reminds me of, I'll zoom in on it, it reminds me of, uh, take a string, okay, and, and put it around a circle and paste marshmallows on it and just keep going around and around and around. The string itself is, is its RNA core, so that's a single-stranded molecule, which indicates how this tobacco mosaic virus should be constructed. It's its genetic code. And its capsid protein is just like these little sort of leaflets, almost looking like marshmallows. And then we have, over here, something like an influenza virus. Now, our influenza virus, um, a student described this to me the other day, and I thought it was like the best explanation I'd ever heard. He said, well, that's kind of neat. You know, that thing's got an RNA core, 
Okay, so that's single-stranded genetic core. And it's capsid. Is, it's like a green tennis ball with thumbtacks sticking out of it. Now those thumbtacks turn out to be little protein markers and they're the same kind of markers. They're, they're like um, keys and these keys open the locks to cells in your respiratory system. Uh, when, they, when they make you sick and as they infect your respiratory cells, when they reproduce and leave, as they leave the infected cells, it's kind of like leaving a house and stealing the keys on the way out just so you can get back into similar homes. That's exactly what these things do. These little surface proteins, these little devils down here are the locks, or sorry, rather the keys to, to your respiratory system cell locks. And they use them to get right back in. As soon as I see a membrane here, it reminds me that, oh yeah, these things, these things, this virus here is not just made up of protein, but it's also got a lipid layer around itself as well. And that's that's a huge advantage for these things to get back into cells because cells have a cell membrane which is made up of lipids. Let's pop out for a second. And I just want to show you, uh, here we go. I just want to show you what the tobacco mosaic virus uh, does. Tobacco mosaic, it's amazing, YouTube these days. You pop out to images and you can find it pretty quickly. So even looking at Google images they show the um, the RNA sequence of the virus and then in these pictures you can see what the virus does to the tobacco plant. It causes uh, lysis of the cells, these browning, these brown regions and it's just it, it just damages the crops immensely which is even by, by today's standards there's not as much smoking as, as in the past but it is a huge industry and this is a huge economic loss. Under the electron microscope now this is a transmission electron microscope you see these little rods that's that's what what we've been able to see by bouncing light waves off them and with a little bit of work we found out exactly what it was that was inside it's very tiny I mean I think our scale here is 300 nanometers to 18 billionths of a meter in width and it causes plenty of damage. Let's sneak back out. Okay. So as, uh, as you're filling this in, um, at any time you can speed me up, slow me down, skip what I'm saying. That's the beauty of this being recorded. This is what the T4 bacteriophage looked like uh, once we sort of got a, an electron microscope snapshot of it. Now this one is a DNA or double-stranded uh, critter. So and I always draw DNA so poorly, but I'll, I'll do my best for you. Inside, it's got the twisted ladder. There we go. Well, that was a bit better. That we all know and love uh, called Mr. DNA if you ever saw Jurassic Park. The rest of the virus really is just the protein coat. And this thing stole on its way out when it killed the poor bacterium. It stole a little bit of ATP or energy so that it can infect cells in the future. Because when it lands and it plunges its end plate into a cell that actually does require a little bit of energy. And um, speaking of which, I've great, got a great little video for you. It's interesting. It's like a, a quick little YouTube snapshot. So I'm going to pop out. And um, if the volume level is a little too high, I'll apologize now. It's got Pirates of the Caribbean music, which I think is really exciting and fun. Uh, so let's see here. Ah, bacteriophage animation. Let's go full screen. And what you're about to see, these little green things, are Escherichia coli, known as E. coli. And these little parasites are going to descend on them, these little, this little army of hypodermic needles. And they're going to land on them, and they're going to infect them and take them over.
that's a pretty neat little sequence there. So I'll turn my mirroring back on. What you had seen was them uh, injecting their genetic code. And you actually, you were looking down once you went inside the bacteriophage, when it injected, did that power injection, you could see its, its DNA its, was being thrust down into the cell and literally was inserting into the genome of the bacterium, taking it over. Um, it's literally like a, well, I guess, like a computer virus taking over a computer system. And that's the way they do business. Once they once they take over their host, they're able to um, instruct the host to make their children uh, bodies of little viruses and to make copies of the virus genetic code and literally put the new virus DNA that's been reproduced into all these little empty bodies and then those there you go you've got a surrogate mother of a cell and what she's done is she has put together the virus babies and given birth to them unfortunately the poor uh, surrogate cell dies it's done and that's the ultimate in in a parasitic infection kill the host right so viral infection interestingly enough doesn't have to f follow the uh, life cycle of death Let's put it that way. I was just talking about one where the host dies, the surrogate cell dies, but it, it is a little sneakier not to kill your host. And if you think about that, what if you just use your host, infect the host, and let the host live? This is pretty neat. So there's two life cycles you'll need to know here that are coming up, and you, thou shalt know them because they're, they're so important. There's the lytic one where the... It, that basically results in in death of the cell, uh, death of the host, and then there's one called lysogenic. And if you think about genesis, right? That's that's where this this um, virus, once it's integrated into your cells, just allows your cells to reproduce with it inside of it. And that just keeps making copies of the virus without any death to the host. It turns out that it's a good deal to let the host keep going. We'll clarify here as we move forward. So here we go. This is an overview of what happens. I'll zoom in. Uh, we're going to use the T4 bacteriophage as our stock example. And our T4 phage, because I can zoom right in here, lands on our poor little uh, E. coli. So let's label who's who. You probably know where the phage is, right? This is your phage here with its genetic core. So that's its that's its DNA. And this is our phage. We'll just label it with T4 because I'm working pretty close here. And this is E. coli, this yellow pill. There we go. And this blue thing in the middle is the DNA so I'll use the same color it has deoxyribonucleic acid as its genetic code just like you and I and there we go it's it's not in a membrane remember these are prokaryotic organisms meaning pro meaning before there was and karyo meaning a nucleus so there's E. coli with its it's stuffed full of DNA essentially The bacteriophage injects its genome inside, and in this case, once it's inside, we'll refer to it as a prophage, and we'll switch the color to, to red, just to make a point. We need to, we need to make a distinction so we know it from the host genetic code. Okay, so we'll use red now. The body here on the outside is useless. It, it falls off. It's done its job. Sinar. What's going to happen is the virus... DNA is going to integrate into our host and it will literally save over a region. It fits in and then it, it, it goes into that spot or, or whatever relative spot in the genome. Now if if the cell goes into the lysogenic phase, I'll go with this one first, that genome has been copied in here and it's right here. So when the whole 
when when the bacterium divides, it's basically got um, it's 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 got the virus DNA integrated into it, and in the genesis phase, it, these cells will do what they normally do through uh, cloning or asexual reproduction. They'll make other baby cells that might even do sexual reproduction, but there's a stowaway. And in this case, the stowaway right there, we call the prophage. It's not a virus. It's the virus genetic code. Just a virus in genetic mode. That, that's, that's how I like to think of it. As the cell divides, let's say it was asexual reproduction, let's just say it cloned, you had initially one cell infected, now you have two. You can see how this is a very smart parasitic strategy because your what you want to do to survive is to pass on your genetic code. Well, not only is this the passing off, on of the genetic code, but it's multiplying. It, this virus is increasing its numbers by just letting the cell naturally divide. So allowing genesis to go on is, is just fine. Now something happens to the cell and this this is interesting. Um, this is PhD style work here where the cell suffers some kind of damage or some kind of environmental uh, distress upon itself. That could be say UV light like for example in the springtime when I go out skiing I forget to put on the lip balm and I notice it doesn't take very much longer than one or two weekend skiing sessions and my cold sore is out. <coughs> so UV light it's generally the the UV light that causes damage to my lip cells and that light is busy shining on the genetic material causing damage and it seems to be that it's the damage that is sensed by the cell and that stimulates the prophage to go into <clears throat> what I like to call get out of dodge mode. If the prophage thinks, and I'm using that term in a personification way, if it's not in the prophage's interest to be in the cell anymore, it's going to go into its what we call its lytic phase. It is going to assemble uh, virus bodies. It's going to put copies of its genetic code into as many bodies as it can and it's going to go search for more hosts because damage due to stress like when you're run down UV light and heck I can even I, I can bring on a coarser incident um, just by uh, mindlessly kind of it's it's bizarre but chewing on your lip you're just kind of uh, chomping on your lip a little bit and that if you just run your lip over your teeth a bit that pressure is enough for me to trigger uh, an outbreak. So whatever the source of the damage, it could be chemical, UV, stress, etc. Your immune system, you're worn down. What happens is the lysogenic phase is toast. The virus is busting out looking for a better situation, a healthier home and it goes out of the lysogenic phase and then it goes lytic. Lytic is a word which means to cut. Lysis is a word that means to cut. Because by the end of this, it's like the movie Alien, where the creature comes busting out of the poor host. That's what these viruses will do. Let's zoom in. What you're seeing is the assembly of uh, the virus bodies and copies of the genetic code. The virus is making as many copies of itself as it can using the host. So the host puts it all together, makes copies, assembles the proteins, literally like virus, virus bodies, puts it all together, isn't that nice, and it causes its own doom because these newly assembled T4 bacteriophages will bust right out of the E. coli cell and on a uh, when you're working in the lab you know you have T4 bacteriophages because what will occur is that the bacterial plate will start to develop clear spots where the uh, E. coli are dying. It's neat yeah you can grow viruses in the lab in fact I did it at UVic it was it was very interesting. Look for the clear spots that's where the virus is. So when you step back from the you look at the whole cycle and you say okay 
there's two directions this could go. <coughs> I mean, it is possible that the virus could go straight to the lytic phase and it alternatively could go to the lysogenic infective phase. Lysogenic just has certain advantages. Lots of replication going on there. But if the virus needs to bust out for whatever reason, usually damage to the host cell and the host genetic code, it'll go lytic and uh, you basically get the uh, virus replication. And you're back to square one here, going and finding another host to infect and copying in the genetic code just like that. The rest of the slideshow is just little uh, bits and pieces of, of what I've talked about, sort of one at a time. So I, I won't go on ad nauseum. You'll see after after the next couple of slides that we're just it's kind of a repetitive bit of information. But I love this electron micrograph where you can see an infected E. coli cell. You could see the T4 bacteriophage here. And it's it's sort of interesting. I think this is lysis where they're they're busting out, right? Because it appears to me that they're emerging from the cell. And that is the end game for that poor little Escherichia coli cell. Okay, uh, I'll just quickly mention a few of these. I don't want to be too repetitive, but in the lytic infection, it's the cell which synthesizes new phages. So you create the proteins for the bodies and the the DNA. Let's since this is T4, let's label it. Okay, that's what we're looking at in this case. Make the bodies, make the genetic code, and put them together like this. Package them up, and this it's the cell that's doing this based on the uh, viral DNA sequences. The, the, vi the virus DNA is what instructs the cell how to put the virus together. It's the blueprint. And then they just bust out. Lysogenic, on the other hand, just to summarize, is a smart way to make copies of yourself without busting out. You just exist in the prophage form where you're integrated with the host cell. So I'll give you a moment to scribble down or you can always pause if I'm going too quickly. That's that's also a possibility. And then here's just more detailed information, much uh, much in the vein or similarity with what I did on the um, sort of the overall uh, diagram before. So that prophage goes in there and you have to know that this term is necessary. I mean, it's got to be called something. It is the virus. So what are you going to call it when it doesn't have a body? Well, let's call it the prophage. Now, this might be T4, but this is also happening um, when you have a uh, when you're infected with the herpes simplex virus. For example, with cold sores, I I have to um, make sure that I get a lot of rest, don't get too run down, stay healthy, so that really it kind of sounds kind of sad that my lip cells stay in the lysogenic phase because otherwise I'll just have a big uh, fever blister when the lytic phase kicks in. So this is just replication and this is the name of the game. Uh, they're doing very well here these prophages because they're getting copied by the cell. The cell doesn't know any better. And this would be sort of the final stage of a lysogenic infection <clears throat> when the prophage exits the bacterial chromosome and then decides, hey, I'm going into the lytic cycle. Now, what's, this, this is very fascinating research work because the environmental stimulus that generates this action, right, whether it's the UV light or the chemical damage or the physical damage or the stress or whatever it is, um, whatever triggers the prophage DNA to dissociate like this would be a fabulous uh, fabulous lecture topic for university and I never did actually hear that one but you know you can't take it all in and we're back to our lytic infection where the the cells metabolism is taken over and we're getting virus babies
Okay, so sorry, I don't mean to be going too fast for you, but this is about one step away from uh, the alien phase, as I like to refer to. Okay. Right now, it's um, as I'm filming this, it's October. When you look at the time of the year when we start to get sickest, and let's choose red because that's annoying. Ha, I like that. I noticed when we got back to school that everybody started getting sick right around here. You hear about your friends getting sick, and then as soon as we get in North America, mind you, to the height of flu season, it's basically around December and starts to tail off a little bit here. I mean, these aren't exactly our sunshine months. We're inside, we're breathing recycled air. Um, people are sick, they're coughing into their hands, they're wipe, they're putting their hands on tabletops. Other people are unknowingly you know, putting their hands on the same tabletops and, and touching their faces, noses, eyes. You know, it's hard to keep your hands off your face. Here's a challenge. For one day, just notice how many times you literally put your hands on your face or look around in a class and see how many times people do it. We do it without thinking. The best time to get ahead of this is to get uh, immunized, a flu shot, what have you, around this period here. Make your immune system a little bit more aware of what's going on early because you want to have antibodies or some form of immunity before you crash headlong into the flu season. And it's just a smart bet. When you do get immunized, realize that the flu shot that you're getting for that year is a guess as to, our, pretty well our best guess, educated guess, as to what the virus's bodily structure is going to look like. It's hard, it's hard to nail it accurately because these viruses mutate so heavily. But we do know when they're going to get going, usually when we get the least amount of sunlight and get worn down. The flu, or uh, rhinoviruses, cold viruses, um, will do this as well as the influenza viruses. They love to get up your respiratory tract. And they are extremely well adapted at infecting our respiratory cells. So from the nasal passages all the way down the, the trachea, um, down into our bronchi, they go after our cells. And they're very small, so they can get around quite well and you get that intense hacking and coughing and and as you start to show the symptoms and you're hacking and coughing you're releasing um, the virus back up out into the air one of the nastiest viruses is a retrovirus this is a little bit above the pay grade for biology 11 but a retrovirus is literally um, well, it's quite retro. Let's put it this way. D um, they have RNA as their genetic code, which is quite old and mutates uh, fairly heavily. That's that's something you see with a lot of flu viruses and you see with um, things like HIV, which means that the virus, if it's going to mutate very quickly, is a, definitely a troubling one for your immune system to catch up with because it's like it's a different invader every year it's changing so much that your immune system has a hard time keeping track of it now this retrovirus and I'll talk about uh, uh, a uh, the human immunodeficiency virus for example retroviruses start out as RNA viruses but in order to integrate with our genetic sequence they have to convert their single-stranded RNA to double-stranded DNA and that is quite a trick turns out that HIV has a, a wondrous enzyme that does this called reverse transcriptase. It's, it's amazing. So let's push this out of the way. T, and I'll just have to borrow a little bit of space there. Reverse transcriptase. And that is exactly what HIV does. It has an RNA core, but it's found a way to hide inside our cells as its DNA version. When it replicates and leaves and makes little baby uh, HIV cells, it turns its hidden DNA in, in us, in our cells, and it reverse scribes it back into RNA. Uh, that's an amazing trick, and it's, it's a feat 
of evolution. It's evolved to do this. Now, interestingly enough, there's a lot of research going into that. Because uh, there was a famous line once said, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Well, if viruses use us to deliver their genetic material to make us basically um, surrogate mothers, right, to reproduce them, well, it stands to reason that as we identify what they do and we understand that they're basically gene delivery systems, we can use them to deliver genes of our own construction. Genes, perhaps, for genetic therapies ways of um, repairing cells of the respiratory system. Perhaps we can reprogram cells in our lungs to no longer create that protein which happens with cystic fibrosis. That protein which which gums up our lungs and creates an, infect, uh, an infective environment where bacteria can get embedded down deep where our immune systems can't get. We could use viruses to reprogram cells and make them healthier we just have to reprogram the viruses. Now that, ladies and gentlemen, is incredibly interesting work. And there's a future there. Think about it. So this is chapter 19 too, uh, viruses. I'll, I will be talking about um, vaccines, but I'm going to hold off on vaccines a little bit, a little bit, until we get to disease. Okay, so this has been a lengthy lecture, but I hope you've enjoyed it. It was fun to do. Mr. B, signing off.